All right, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, last week we covered the first temptation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness. Uh, this week we will talk about the second. We'll be looking at verses 5 through 7. It says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again this morning, Lord, we, we are thankful and blessed that we have your Holy Word, Lord, that we can look to it to find your will, what you would have us to do. And Lord, as we look at this uh, second temptation of your Son, Jesus, Lord, I pray that, that we can all take a, take a lesson, a life application, Lord, that we can look at it and, and, and look to overcome certain things in our life, Lord, that, that we can be strong and, and that most of all that we never tempt you or test you, Lord. In, in all that we do, Lord, that we can humbly follow you. Lord, I, I pray this morning that, that no word that comes out of my mouth is my own. Lord, that I pray that I have nothing to say. And Lord, that you would uh, anoint me and bless me, Lord, that you will speak through me, Lord, that, and, and that the people will hear through the power of your Holy Spirit, that I speak through that power and they hear through that power, Lord, that they can take it to their hearts, anything that you'd want them to know, anything you'd want them to hear and learn. And, and Lord, we pray that your word becomes a part of us as much as our skin, as, as much as our hair, as much as our eyes, our nose, Lord, that, it's, that knowing your word is one of our other senses, Lord, and that anything we do, Lord, that we look to your word and your guidance. And Lord, it's in your Son's most precious name we pray. Amen. So as I said, this is the second temptation of Jesus, and, and Luke uh, kind of changed Luke in his gospel kind of changes the orders around. This is the last temptation that Jesus goes through, but here in Matthew is the second. But it, he was tempted the same nonetheless. He had to withstand both temptations, the same temptations. And if we can kind of look at it here in round one, in one through four, uh, you know, Jesus overcomes Satan with the power of his word. You know, he said, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so, the round one went to the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And now we're set up for round two. And we look in verse five, and Satan, he takes him into Jerusalem. That's the holy city. And he sets him on the highest point of the temple. That's the pinnacle. And last week, he, he asked Jesus, he said, if thou be the son of God, you know, it wasn't questioning, hey, if you are, he's saying, basically saying, since you are. And we talked about how he questioned uh, God's providence, saying, you know, why are you even hungry? You know, he was 40 days in the wilderness fasting, and so the devil is questioning that. Why has God let you hunger to this extent? Why has he let you thirst to this extent if you are his son? Where is his care? Where is, where is his providence? And so here... He says, if you be the Son of God, you know, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Now, we, we talked about how uh, Jesus won by using His Word in the first temptation. And I look at it, Satan probably said, you know what, too, can play at that game. I know Scripture as well. I say, and you can bet Satan knows Scripture. You know, you can bet that he knows how to pervert Scripture to meet his ends, to get us to do what he'd have us to do. He did it in the garden with Adam and Eve. He knew what God had told them. He knew every word that God had told them. But yet, he perverted it to get them to, to give in to their lust. And so here he takes Psalm 91, 11 and 12. And, and ba that's basically verbatim to what Psalm 91, 11 and 12 is. Except it, 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 uh, it leaves out a few words where it says, uh, 
shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and, they, and it says, and they shall keep thee in all thy ways. Now, much can be said about what gets left out. You know, Satan knows what buttons to push. He knows what scriptures to push. You know, people nowadays when they want to kind of, when they want to endorse a sin, whatever it may be, we look at some of the social issues that we have going on in this country. You know, there's a lot of people that point to scripture to approve of those sins. And what they have done is they have taken scripture out of context, they've perverted it, and that's what the devil would have us to do. But much can be said about what gets left out. You know, why didn't, didn't Satan continue after Psalm 91, 11, and 12? And, and I preached on Psalm 91 as a few months ago. But after 11 and 12, when we go to verse 13, it says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under thy feet. So Satan leaves that verse out. Why? Because it was talking about victory over him. Every one of those things mentioned, the lion, the adder, the, uh, adder, the dragon, all those things are personifications of Satan. They are symbolic of Satan. When we look in Revelation, he says, that old serpent. First Peter says, uh, he is a roaring lion that seek, seeks who, to whom he may devour. Revelation, he's referred to as the dragon. All those things are symbolic of Satan. And so Satan perverts 11 and 12 and then leaves out verse 13 saying that basically we'll ultimately have victory over him because he don't want us to know that. And I almost think that there's times that he's deceived himself enough that he believes a lie as well. You know, that he denies the power of God and God's victory over him. That we look at how what Jesus did on the cross and how uh, he attained victory over Satan through that. You know, he, he kind of, he don't want us to know about that. He don't want us to believe that. And, and he has denied the power of God in doing that. And he looks at what he asked Jesus to do. He wants Jesus to reduce himself to just some kind of magician. <clears throat> Somebody that does parlor tricks. You know, he's saying, look, jump off this building and have your angels come and catch you up. That'll amaze some people. That'll look good. God is not interested in that. God is not interested in parlor tricks. He's not interested in signs. You know, <clears throat> Psalm 91 or any other scripture doesn't ask us to do anything stupid like jump off a building. You know, or walk out into traffic. We can't make decisions like that and expect God to save us. We put ourselves in situations all the time. And, and, and I love uh, Adrian Rogers. He says, you, you have the right to make your choice. But once you make that choice, you choose your consequences. You can't change it after you make that choice. And so... You know, you choose to jump off a building, you're going to have to live with the repercussions of it. You can't change mid-flight. And so we get ourselves in situations, and, and we don't want to take on the consequences of our actions, and we'll get ourselves into sin, or whatever it may be, and we'll ask God to bless it. Or we'll say, Lord, deliver me out of this, when you shouldn't have got in it to begin with. You know, and... When we go outside of God's will and we want His blessing, we lose something there. You know, I, I heard a preacher one time, he was, talking about, he was talking about young people. And young people, teenagers, they have a lot of temptations on them. And, and we may say, okay, we see the things they do, that they do, and we, just, we may look at it as it's a part of growing up, but it's a part of life. But I can guarantee you, if there's a teenager who's never taken a drink of alcohol, never engaged in premarital sex, and he waits till he's married uh, and doesn't uh, take a drink of alcohol, doesn't smoke dope, doesn't smoke cigarettes, whatever it may be, I can guarantee you when they're old, they won't regret not doing that. You know, I can tell you, I can stand here and regret doing some of those things. But when they get old, they will not regret not taking part in that sin. And... and there's a lot of people, I think it affects them later in life when they look back. And we can be saved from it. We can be redeemed from it. But I, I think if, if, we could have, if we could have maintained our holiness throughout all of that, you know, we could, we could be stronger for it when we get old. And, you know, that, that's not to say that um, 
you know, teenagers are not going to be perfect. They live in a world with more temptation than what I had to. And, and that was just 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. You know, so, you know, we, just because we get in ourselves, ourselves in a situation and we ask God to get us out. Now, we will look at Psalm 106, 15. And remember Psalm 106, because I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. But it says, and this is talking about the Israelites in the wilderness and how they had uh, strayed away from God. They'd gotten themselves in situations and they wanted God for deliverance. You know, when, when, uh, in the Gospel of John, when it talks about how Jesus has to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, when Israel had sinned and Moses or God sent in the poisonous snakes and it was biting the people and they were dying, and, and then they asked for forgiveness. Then they asked for deliverance out of it. Well, they got themselves in it anyway. You know, we're going to sin, but we we got to go into everything that we do with a humble heart to keep ourselves as pure as possible. We have been called to be holy, and, and we we don't take that seriously. We 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 take the idea sometimes. You know what? If I sin, God will forgive me. That's that great thing about grace. But. Psalm 106, 15, it says, He gave them their request. You know, when they requested deliverance from the, the trials they were in because of their sin, He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. So He delivered them. He did as they asked. But it says He sent leanness into their soul. You know, He may have satisfied their physical lust. He may have delivered them from uh, whatever it was whatever affliction he had put on them, but he says he sent leanness into their soul. You know, when, we'll get into a minute of how uh, this is referencing this scripture, Matthew 4, 5 through 7, especially verse 7, is referencing the uh, place where water come out of the rock. And, uh, you know, what happened there? They were thirsty. And they, and they chided and contended with Moses because they wanted something to drink. But oftentimes, we believe God, if He would give us a sign, our faith would be stronger. You know, that's maybe sometimes, you know, we, we looked at, at Psalm 91 there. That's what the devil was trying to get Jesus to do, just do some miraculous sign. You know, when we look at uh, the Exodus in the Old Testament, even Pharaoh's magicians could do some of the things to, to mimic the plagues. You know, they turned water that was in a bowl into, in, in, well, I won't say it was blood, but they turned it to red, light blood. You know, they was even able to cast down their staffs and they turned into serpents as well. And, and so we, we can't put our faith in cheap parlor tricks. You know, even the generation of Jesus was the same. They kept wanting a sign. They said, Master, Teacher, give us a sign. And He said, A wicked and crooked, adulterous generation asked for a sign. He said, I'm not going to give you no sign but the sign of Jonah. And that's the cross, that's three days in the tomb, and that's his resurrection. That's all the sign that we need. When we got God's Word backing that up and showing us that that, that is all that we need. We have faith, but we want, to, we want to sit over here and we say, God, if you would move that microphone stand, I'll believe you more. But that's never enough. Just these cheap miracles, these cheap signs are never enough. Because we look at, the, at Israel, the, they had saw the ten plagues, they had came through the Red Sea on dry ground, they had saw the army of the Egyptians drowned after they crossed the Red Sea, but yet they still wanted more. They still needed more signs. You know, they, they ended up having to see water come out of a rock. They ended up having to see manna supplied to them that them nor their fathers had seen. They had to see quail delivered to them every day. You know, they still needed more, and there wasn't enough. And, and even in the New Testament with Jesus, they, people would come and question Him, and question Him, wanting signs, wanting answers, and He asked them at one point in time, He said, Why do you tempt Me? And that tempt word in the Bible means test. So he's saying, why do you test me? Why are you coming out after me to ask these questions or to give you these cheap signs, these cheap miracles? Why are you testing me? And that's what uh, the devil was trying to get Jesus to do there. He was testing him. He was testing God. He was testing God's power. 
And, and, and Jesus t- replied the same, Then why do you test me? And he called them a wicked, adulterous generation. And we do the same thing today. Every one of us. We'll spend our whole weeks testing God. And then we'll come in on Sunday morning and we want Him to deliver us from that. And, and I will get into that a little bit more in a minute. No, I will not do it now. Ezekiel 20. Verses 30 through 32. Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are you polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredom after their abominations? For when ye offer your gifts, when ye make your sons to pass through the fire, ye pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day, and shall I be inquired of you? O house of Israel, as I live, saith the Lord, I will not be inquired of by you. And that which cometh into your mind shall not be at all, that ye say, We will be as the heathen, as the families of the countries, to serve wood and stone. What he was saying there, he was talking about how the people would live in sin, and then they would go to the prophet, they would go to Ezekiel, and they would ask God's will for them. And so God was saying, Look, you, you choose not to follow me through all this time. You serve these idols made of wood and stone that can't talk, they can't see, they have no senses, they can't do anything that I can do, not even close. You're going to follow them all week, and then you're going to come and talk to me. You're going to come and ask me for a blessing. You're going to come and talk to me that, that you want to know my will. He said, Why don't you follow me the rest of the time? You know, and, and you know, that's what we do. The Israelites, it, it, it talks about how they would eat and drink and be merry and they would go away from God. When Moses, the little time that he spent up on the mountain, they built the, the golden calves. You know, we, we can't do actions like that, do things like that, and expect God to respond like we want when He calls us to be a holy people. And... You know, we may sit here and we may look around and you say, who's he talking to? When I'm talking to every one of us, and I say us, you know, we may look around and we say, well, I'm more spiritual than them. I know God better than them. My relationship with God is better than them. When I'm talking to every one of us, we can always grow, we can always be better. But, you know, we can't take for granted following God every minute of every day. Because when we're not, we're tempting Him. We're testing Him. You know, so in in this Scripture, Jesus responded to Satan with with Scripture again. It's Deuteronomy 6.16. He says, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now when you go to Deuteronomy 6.16, there's another line added. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel before they're ready to cross the Jordan. He says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God as you did at Massa. And that's where they was thirsty, they needed water, and that's when Moses, God used Moses to cause the water to come out of the rock. That happened when they were only one month out of Egypt. Thirty days. Thirty days after seeing the Red Sea part, they was questioning how God was going to provide for them. They were thirsty. And, and, you know, and it's not like they didn't really contend with God straight up. You know, they went to Moses. It says they chided and contended with Moses. Well, that's putting their faith in somebody else instead of looking to God. It talks about in Exodus is when Moses would go to the tabernacle, everybody else, they'd come out of their tents and they'd stand in the door of the tents because they'd piggyback on Moses' relationship with God. Psalm 106.16, I mentioned that I would come back to it, and I'll do it again before we're done. It says, They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. So they looked at Aaron and Moses, they, was, they almost worshipped them. You know, we look in the New Testament and see how the people in Israel put Moses and Abraham and some of the other prophets up on a pedestal, and, and just because Jesus, when He said He was the Son of God, that, that they, He made Himself equal with God and put Himself above those prophets that they honored and respected so much, you know, that was part of the reason that He got put to death. But, but this, 
this time the, at Massa and Meribah, that's where the water came out of the rock, that's recorded in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. And so, you know, they chided and they contended with Moses. It's, they didn't trust God. And, and, you know, we may look at it and you say, well, how are they testing God? You know, and that was the response that Moses gave to him in Deuteronomy. He says, you should not tempt the Lord thy God. They tested God because they did not trust Him to provide for them. And, and you don't test anybody that you trust. You, and when you test somebody, you're setting them up to either fail or to pass. And in any relationship you have, if you trust someone, you don't test them. You know, if... I... I've seen now, now we've done this, it, you know, my wife may leave the clothes out on the table and just to test the kids, see how long it takes take them to put them up. You know, well that's because you, she don't trust them to put them up. It's that simple. But now if we trust God, like we say we trust God, that we come here on Sunday mornings and say we put our faith in Jesus Christ, if we trust Him like we say we do, we won't tempt Him, we won't test Him. A lot of times we put our faith more in men and people than anybody else. You know, we, we as a church, or any church, I, I, and I've talked to people and seen them do this, that a church, okay, if they want to increase their membership and they want their church to grow, well, they put it squarely on the pastor. Now, the pastor plays a role in it. Don't get me wrong. But, I can guarantee you the people most responsible for growing a church is the people in the church and their relationship with God. You know, you can't expect one person to, to grow a church. It's the people here. You know, and you can't just look for numbers. You've got to look for everybody in the church to follow God wholeheartedly to submit themselves to Him and His will. In their thirst, they wanted to return to Egypt. You know, we, we see the verses. When they was hungry, they said, we had all the bread that we could eat in Egypt. When they was thirsty, they said, we, have the, we had the great river in Egypt. They're talking about the Nile River, one of the greatest rivers in the world. You've got the Nile River Delta. It's one of the most fertile crop lands in the world. But, you know, like I said, this just a, a month ago, all that water was red. It was blood. You can't drink it. But yet they wanted to go back. You know, and, and when we lose our trust in God, we turn, we'll put our trust in things we have no business trusting. We'll put our trust in, in, in people. We'll put our trust in money. We'll put our trust in material things. They was putting their trust in bloody water that they couldn't drink because they did not trust God. They would, they would have rather go back, put their trust in that tainted, poison water and either be killed by the Egyptians for what they did when they left. You know, they, they got all kinds of loot and gold and treasures and the whole army of Egypt was killed. You know, they could have been killed for that if they went back or they'd just be put back into bondage. Build more pyramids, build more cities. They would rather have that than depending solely on God. In Exodus, Exodus 17, after Moses, after the water comes out of the rock, Moses, he calls the place Massa and Meribah. Massa means tempted, tested. Meribah means contention. It shows that they tested and contended with God at that place. You know, and, and so how did they do it? How do we do it? You know, and... Psalm 78, there's three verses. And Psalm 78, is, is, it's, it's a pretty long psalm. It's one of the longer psalms. And, and it talks quite a bit in depth about the Israelites in the wilderness. And so there's three verses that talks about how they tempted God in the wilderness. And three things that it points out is their lust, their limiting, and the law. So in Psalm 78, and verse 18, this talks about their lust says, they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. You know, the lust of their eyes. The, the, their flesh became weak and they, was, they needed something to eat. They didn't depend on God to sustain them. 
You know, they didn't, they didn't think, okay, you know, Moses before long, he's going to stay up on a mountain 40 days and not eat anything. We've gone 30 and we're about to die. 106.14 says, But they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Because I talked last week with that Jesus quoted Deuteronomy when Moses said, Man should not live by bread alone. And, and I mentioned we're going to get hungry. It's not, it's not a sin to be hungry. But it's a sin to not put your faith in God to quench that hunger. You know, to we know that God, and I firmly believe God provides everything we have. When we sit down to dinner at our house, and we ask for a blessing on the food, I thank God for everything on that, on that table because I know He supplied every bit of it. But when we seek to satisfy our flesh, the lust thereof, you know, we tend to fall into sin. You know, we, we can look at the Garden of Gethsemane. And, you know, the disciples were sleepy. They were tired. And they could not stay awake and watch with Jesus. Jesus commanded them, pleaded with them, watch with me. But yet every time he went back, they would be asleep. And he'd say, stay awake. He said, I know your flesh is weak. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. And, and in a sense, they lusted after sleep. You know, and we have to, when we take up the cross of Jesus Christ, we have to deny the flesh. Denying ourselves. That is the flesh. And, and, and we many times don't do that. We, we have to do this. We have to do that. You know, the, the lust of the flesh. You know, you know, it's like going into a cupcake factory and you don't need to have any sweets and you say, I'm just going to go look around. You know, those candy shops in Gatlinburg. If you ain't supposed to have chocolate or sugar and you go, I'm just going to look around. You can't do that. And, and when you step into sin and, and think that you on your own can, can deny the lust of the flesh, whatever it may be, whether it be sexual sin, mental sin, the, the love of money, you know, we, we can't think too highly of ourselves that we can do it on our own. You know, the lust of the flesh, that is who we are. When we pick up the cross of Christ, we have to deny that part of our bodies. You know, Paul said that, that he kills the flesh, that he dies daily. And that's what he's talking about, that he struggles with that. Because Paul himself said, the things that I don't want to do, I do, because he gave in to the lust of the flesh. And if Paul could had at times give in to the lust of the flesh, who are we to think that we can't? That we are strong enough to overcome it by ourselves? Because we can't deny the lust of the flesh without the help of God. In Psalm 78, 41, it says, They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. This is where I said they didn't think God had the power to sustain them. They didn't think God had the power to, to quench their thirst. You know, we look in John 4, and when he's talking to the woman at the well, he tells her, he says, Those who drink of the water I give them shall never thirst again. You know, that's that life-giving, fully quenching water of life. Living water, Jesus called it. 2 Timothy 3, 5. It's talking about, especially in the last days, but it was as applicable then, as applicable now. He talks about people, churchgoers, that fall into to many sins. It says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And why I say this is talking about churchgoers, he says, having a form of godliness. We have a lot of people in this country that have a form of godliness because, 
you know, we may think that because they show up on Sunday morning, Michael was talking about how we need to put me, not me first, we, that we do that a lot and we shouldn't, that we ought to put God first. But he talks about all these different forms of sin and, and Paul's telling Timothy they have a form of godliness. They look good on paper. They look good on the outside, but it says, but they deny the power thereof. They deny the power of God is when they take part in those things and they try to ignore what goes on. You know, in Jeremiah 23, 24 says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Do not I fill heaven and earth. God's telling Jeremiah, so look, they can't hide from me. I see this. If, if they are sinners, I know it. I see it. And, say, and then they come in and inquire of me on Sunday morning, and, and they show this form of godliness, but it says they deny the power thereof. And Paul tells Timothy, from such, turn away. He tells them, from those people, turn away from them. It says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They deny the power of God. We, we have restricted God today to just some distant God that doesn't care that once he started the earth in motion, a lot of people use the analogy of a watchmaker, that he wound up the watch and he's all hands off now. And if he was hands off, he wouldn't have sent his son Jesus. You know, if he was hands off, he wouldn't have worried about saving me or you. We deny the power of God by... by Neglecting what it says in Genesis. We deny the power of God by ignoring what it says in the New Testament about sin. That we deny the power of God that we, we think, well, God don't want to heal me. We deny the power of God when we think God can't save my children. We deny the power of God when we say we won't get a blessing when we come to church. We deny the power of God when we come in and... and and we depend on everybody else. That we have no interest in God moving during a service. You know, I see it a lot of times. If it starts getting past 12 o'clock, you know. I, 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 I see it. Sometimes I wish, you know, people could see what I see. Because I see everybody. I see their face. You know, it, it's part of it. It's every church is like it. You know, but, you know, we try to limit God. In Psalm 78, 56, it says, Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 6.17, after he had quoted 6.16, 6.17 goes on and says, Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, His testimonies, His statutes, which He hath commanded thee. And, you know, we look at the great commandment, a lot of times we don't even keep it. Talking about loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself. There's a reason that those two categories are put in there. That God was put there and then our neighbor was put there. That means, for one, we can't do it by ourselves. We, we are not called to have just us and God. That's why we are called to come to church. You know, that we are to love our neighbor and build each other up. When we look at Numbers 20, Just real quick, as, as Moses went to God and said, Hey, what do I do? These people are calling for something to drink. I can't supply it to them. So God tells Moses in verse 8, says, Take the rod, gather the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and shall bring forth to them water out of the rock. So shalt I give the congregation and their beasts drink. Now, in Numbers 20 it says, God told him to speak to the rock. Now, Exodus 17 it says, He told him to smite the rock once. Well, what he does when he talks to these people, he says, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Moses lifted up his hand with his rod, he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank. These people, with their contending with Moses, contending with God, they had caused Moses to stumble. 
Because in his response to them, for one, he come out, he called them names, he called them ye rebels. Then he kind of put the focus on you, must I get water out of this rock instead of God supplying water out of this rock? And then in his anger, he hit the rock twice. And through that event, him and Aaron was caused not to go into the promised land. God had already told the Israelites that they wasn't going to go from Numbers 14 when they were scared to go into the promised land because of the uh, people that was there. But it says, The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. You know, when we tempt God, we, have a, we affect other people. You know, and, and we deny that at times. Well, we are responsible for the people that are around us and, and, and their uh, vision of us, the way they see us. We have to have them to see us as a child of God. And too many times they see us as something else. You know, we are called to be sold out for Jesus Christ. That when people think of us, that's what they think of. That He follows God. And so a lot of times we, we get a little proud you know, we think we can do it on our own, that we can withstand temptation, that we can, uh, we look around, we compare ourselves to other people saying we're more godly than them. And in all that way, we are tempting God. We, we, when we fall into sin, we are tempting God. When we try to uh, think for a sign, we are tempting God. You know, this, this is for all of, there's nobody in any church that doesn't sin. And if you, if you think otherwise, you're tempting God. You know, and, and adultery is the same as the love of money. The Bible says the, root of, the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, we can't separate sin. Sin is sin. And if we fall into it, no matter what it is, we are tempting God. And so our trust should go to God at all times. And that's what Jesus was telling Satan. He said, I'm not going to tempt the Lord my God. I'm going to have Him sustain me. I've been here 40 days in this wilderness. I'm not living by bread alone. I'm not going to do any parlor tricks. I'm depending on God to sustain me this morning. I'm depending on God to heal me. I'm depending on God to feed me. I'm depending on God to quench my thirst. And this morning, if you need to, to look to God for those things, we'll have an invitation as Cheryl and Cleet come up. And, you know, this is the time to do it. You don't wait. When God humbled the Israelites in the wilderness so they could know Him, so they could depend on Him. Sometimes that happens to us, and we want to get out of these situations when God calls us to be tried by our faith. And, you know, we can pray that He gives us the strength to get through these. Let us stand and sing.